Hi, this is Pastor John of the Gospel of Grace Ministries, and this video is the first in the Servant Leadership Series, and is for all ministry leaders and those who aspire to be ministry leaders. Leadership in the Kingdom of God is a lot different from leadership in the world. Life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ has different values than life under the Lordship of the world, or self, or Satan. In God's kingdom, leaders are people who lead like Jesus did. Service, not power or prestige, is the goal of a leader who has Christ as his Lord. True servant leadership begins by submitting to Jesus as master and then following his teachings, his lifestyle, and his commands. People prefer to follow those who love and guide them, not those who just order them around with power and authority. Gene Wilkes, president and professor of New Testament and Leadership at B. H. Carroll Theological Institute in Irving, Texas, wrote, When a church chooses to follow a biblical model of servant leadership for all its leaders, God will work in amazing ways through those servant leaders. Oswald Chambers, who was general director of Overseas Missionary Fellowship in the 1950s and 60s, and authored more than 40 books on Christian life, he said, True greatness, true leadership, is achieved not by reducing men to one service, but in giving oneself in selfless service to them. Or, as we read in Luke 14, verses 1 and 7 to 11, Now it happened, as he, Jesus, went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. So he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noted how they chose the best places. He said to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man. And then you begin with shame and to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who is invited comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Servant leaders humble themselves and wait for God to exalt them. Or as Proverbs 15 verse 33 says, humility comes before honor. And as 1 Peter 5 verse 5 advises us, all of you, be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In the past, I have given in to pride at times and had my ministry resisted by God, preventing it from becoming all that it could have been. Now I remind myself constantly to resist pride so that God doesn't resist me. Things work out a lot better that way. But in order to act that way with humility and not pride, we must first develop 
that as an attitude within our hearts, because out of the heart the mouth speaks, as we're told in Matthew 12, verse 34. That's why it's better to operate out of your new heart and new spirit as Ezekiel encourages us to do, which I covered in full in my New Heart, New Spirit video. We need to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, as described in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If Jesus Christ, part of the triune Godhead, chose to be a servant, how can we aspire to be anything more than that? Jesus humbled himself and served humanity in submission to God the Father. We, therefore, should humble ourselves and serve others in obedience to Jesus. In God's church, his kingdom here on earth, we serve others through ministry. All too often, ministry leaders use their position to boss people around like they do in the world. As Jesus said in Matthew 20, verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. In the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the word translated as minister is shorath, which literally means to serve, to wait upon, to attend to, to contribute to. This reveals that the true focus of ministry is not to exalt ourselves, but rather to serve and attend to the needs of the flock that the Lord Jesus has given us. In the Greek of the New Testament, the word translated as minister is denakoneo, which literally means to be an attendant, that is, wait upon others. It is the word from which we get the title deacon. No one can be a servant without a master. Our master is Jesus Christ. And no one can serve two masters, as Jesus pointed out in Matthew 6, verse 24. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We can substitute other words here for money, like power, or fame, or selfishness, or anything else that we exalt above or in addition to Jesus. And just like Jesus, we must lay all those things aside, just as he laid aside his godly powers. Servant leaders follow Jesus rather than seek a position of authority and prestige. The disciples James and John made the mistake of seeking a position of authority above the other disciples, as described in Mark 35, starting at verse 45. 
Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink and with the baptism that I am baptized with you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The brothers James and John sought to be elevated above all the other disciples into a position of supreme importance and prestige, to sit on either side of Jesus when he assumed his throne. We know that that was never going to happen because we see in six verses in Revelation that there were 24 elders sitting on either side of the throne in heaven. These 24 elders are most likely the 12 apostles and the 12 sons of Jacob, who constantly show their humility and subservience to God the Father and Jesus, as shown in Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before his throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created." And when they said that they were the disciples, James and John, were able to drink the same cup, Jesus acknowledged that they would, because he knew that they would eventually suffer greatly for his name's sake. James was thrown down from the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and then stoned to death. John, the only apostle who did not suffer a martyr's death, was exiled to a penal colony on the Isle of Patmos. And so Jesus did not rebuke them harshly, but used it as a lesson for all of them, after the others became infuriated at the presumptiveness and selfishness of James and John. The lesson being that whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. And then Jesus showed that he too was doing the same thing in the last verse about this event, where he said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we too need to follow his example and seek to serve 
not to receive glory and honor. Servant leaders give up their personal rights, and perhaps even their life, to find success through service to others. All followers of Jesus who seek to serve like Jesus must be willing to also suffer as he did. Suffering like Jesus is part of serving like Jesus, for the world and Satan will greatly resist you and try to stop you from accomplishing anything. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But several verses show us that there are great rewards for those who suffer for Jesus' name's sake. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 13 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 adds, And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, you also will be partaking of the consolation, the reward in heaven. Suffering for Christ comes with the territory of servant leadership, but the rewards far exceed the sufferings. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which refers to any affliction that we have here on earth, which is but for a moment, in comparison to eternity, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's why James was able to say in chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Being a servant leader was perhaps best modeled by Jesus in John 13, verses 3 to 5, which says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This is called the ministry of the towel, or the towel and basin ministry, and it exemplifies the heart of being a servant leader. Jesus, fully knowing the agony he was about to endure, but knowing the joy that was to come afterward, didn't pity himself, but rather humbled himself yet again. Just imagine God washing your feet. How then can we not have the same attitude toward those to whom we minister? The reason that we can do as Jesus did and endure hardships and suffering is because we are confident that we will soon partake of his peace, love, and joy for all of eternity to come. 
Servant leaders must take up the towel of servanthood in order to meet the needs of others, not to have them meet our needs or desires. What Jesus said to the disciples after he had washed their feet is also important, as written in John 13, verses 12 to 17. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. After acknowledging himself as teacher and Lord, he explained to them to do as he had done. But then he also reminded them that the servant is not greater than the master. We can aspire to be like Jesus, but we will never become God. However, Jesus also said that we would be blessed if we followed his example of servant leadership. After Christ ascended to heaven, he poured out his spirit on his 70 followers on the day of Pentecost in the upper room in Jerusalem. Tongues of fire and a mighty rushing wind anointed and ignited them with Peter giving a fiery speech, heard in many languages, leading 3,000 to be saved. So then after that dramatic beginning to the Christian ministry, what did the 3,000 plus the 70 do? Acts 2 verses 42 to 47 explains that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. What a wonderful beginning to Christ's church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, meaning that the apostles became the first leaders and teachers. They also continued in close fellowship and in prayers with one another, selling all their possessions, sharing them with one another, and becoming their own community, having all things in common none of them seeking to be better than or have more possessions than any of the others. They met in the temple, but also house to house, and remained in one accord, and their numbers grew daily. But then, it became, then came the grumbling, as always happens in a growing body of flawed human beings. However, they handled this first sign of discontent very well, applying the principles of servant leadership, as described in Acts 6, verses 1 to 6. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, which were Jews who spoke Greek because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. 
Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. With their numbers now up to an estimated 12,000 people, the 12 apostles had devoted themselves to preaching and teaching the word of God and didn't have the time to take on additional responsibilities. So they summoned everyone together rather than making a unilateral decision among themselves. It is always a good idea for servant leaders to include the congregation in coming to big decisions rather than lording it over them. But they didn't come to the meeting empty-handed. They already had come up with a proposed plan, but they sought input and agreement from all the others. The multitude were pleased with the proposal and to appoint seven men to ensure that everyone was treated equally in the distribution of food and necessities. And they didn't pick the weakest followers to this mundane task, but rather men who were of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. These were the church's first deacons. We see a similar example of sharing the responsibilities of leadership all the way back in Exodus. Moses was responsible for leading the people of Israel to the promised land. One of Moses' responsibilities was to make decisions regarding disputes among the people. Since there were millions of people, Moses sat from morning to evening settling arguments and disputes, which was wearing him out. It took an outsider to see what Moses needed to do, as described in Exodus 18, verses 17 to 27. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and placing such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the word of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten, tens. So they judged the people at all times. And the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. 
Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, saw what Moses couldn't see. Moses was drowning in disputes, using up all his time and energy. He was trying to be the ultimate servant leader, but had not learned the lesson of delegation. Sometimes leaders are reluctant to share their responsibilities because they think it indicates some kind of failure on their part. Others, though, hold too long onto the reins of leadership out of pride, not wanting to share the glory with others. And some, like Moses, are too overwhelmed to think straight. Moses should have taken this to God, but he didn't, so God raised up the unlikely Jethro to show Moses the way. And so Moses did take up Jethro's suggestion and began splitting up the responsibilities to handle and judge the disputes. He created a hierarchical structure and appointed able men to judge the people, leaving only the hard cases for Moses. This allowed Moses to focus on being the people's representative before God and to teach them God's decrees and laws. This followed the same pattern that we saw with the twelve apostles when they appointed the first deacons. We will continue these lessons about servant leadership in the second video of this series. In the meantime, let us not forget to take all our problems and difficulties to the ultimate servant leader, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master. And let us seek to serve others with humility and not to lord it over them. Lead us, Jesus, day by day, hour by hour, to serve you by serving others. For your name's sake and for your glory. Amen.